Welcome to Leadership Reimagined on True Chat, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. Here's your host, Janice Ellig. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Janice Ellig, the CEO and founder of Ellig Group, Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search. We're going to hear from a CEO whose vision for a sustainable future is centered on people, planet, and product. I am delighted to welcome Stefan Tanda, CEO of Aptar Group, a company you may never have heard of, but whose products you likely use each and every day. Actually, millions of people globally use Aptar's products daily at home, at work, and on the move. Because Aptar is a leading global maker of innovative dispensing, sealing, and packaging solutions for beauty, personal care, and household products, as well as for a variety of pharmaceutical, medicines, foods, and beverages. And what Stefan is doing is developing more innovative products to preserve the environment and conserve natural resources. And he's accomplishing this with a diversity of people, which he says that is Aptar's strength. So today, our topic is preserving the planet, the power of people and products, and how this remarkable CEO is driving that globally. So prior to Aptar, Stefan was an executive managing board director at Royal DSM MVs, overseeing their global nutrition pharma joint ventures, and businesses in the Americas. And prior, he held leadership roles at several companies, including DuPont, and lived in seven countries while in these roles. While only coming to Aptar as CEO in 2017, he says, and I quote, he wants his legacy at Aptar to be a sustainable, great, truly global, inclusive enterprise full of decent, smart people who create innovative products that improve our lives daily and responsibly. Stefan, that is a commendable legacy and very humbling. Let's hear about where this comes from, how you've always felt this strongly about preserving the planet. Well, thank you, Janice, uh, for this very generous introduction, and it's really wonderful to be here with you today. Before we get started, uh, I really wanted to thank you for your tremendous contributions to advance a much more inclusive leadership culture in companies all across the country and the world, and for holding us in leadership accountable in a very nice but effective way to have uh, deeds follow our words. So getting back to that legacy quote uh, you just read, uh, it really sums up uh, what drives us at Aptar, and it has all the elements that uh, I came to highly appreciate and seek out over the course of my career. I'm truly highly motivated to build an international enterprise for the long term, an enterprise that is self-sustaining, driven by a great set of people coming from all corners of the earth and thriving in an inclusive performance culture, a culture in which they can truly achieve their full potential. And I love working uh, with these smart and decent people who are passionate about what they do at the same time being self-aware and humble and keeping their egos in check. Yeah, so these are people that you have hired many of these, right? And you develop them in terms of in your own image, but you really want people who can bring a, a sense of purpose to the to the company. And you you want them to create innovative products, right? So you're passionate about being this innovator in the market and you want the people to be there with you. So tell us more about creating these innovative products and with these people um, and being an, a market innovator yourself. Uh, absolutely. And uh, as an engineer, I really like making things, making real products and products that touch consumers in their daily lives, improve our daily lives but also those are products we can connect with. You mentioned it in your introduction, you can talk to your neighbors, your kids about, and they can relate to it. And importantly, doing it in a way that also respects the planet and ideally even uh, make the place a little bit better than we found it uh, and turning it over to our children and grandchildren. So working in such an environment, or at least 
driving towards it, having the ambition to uh, realize that future is highly energizing and really gives purpose to Aptar, but also to me. And you saying, you know, this, um, the genesis of, of this in terms of it, it's a little bit of how you grew up, right? I mean, it, you did not grow up in this country, right? You grew up overseas. So some of this is personal. So uh, both my wife and I, uh, we hail from Innsbruck in Austria. So we grew up in the middle of the Austrian Alps and uh, always enjoyed exploring the outdoors. And we feel a connection to nature. We share many passions uh, from hiking to biking, skiing, flying, all the way to scuba diving. And we have uh, shared these passions with our two daughters. It was actually this passion for flying uh, performance sailplanes in the mountains that led me to appreciate not only the nature, but also plastics engineering, because these gliders are made out of uh, advanced composite plastics. So that was the beginning of your coming to grips with plastics and what it would do in this professional career. So given you were at, you know, uh, other companies before Aptar, including DuPont, tell us about the, your professional experience. I indeed. Um, I joined DuPont following um, a business school in, in Philadelphia and realized quickly the massive responsibility companies have for conducting the operations in a safe and environmentally responsible way. You may remember uh, DuPont uh, uh, embraced at that time the Montreal Protocol to, to phase out uh, CFCs that were in, in, in spray cans and air conditioning units. So DuPont realized rather than resisting the change, they had to be leading the change. And they actually became a founding member of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which today has over 200 companies. And we'll talk about that maybe a bit later. Right. Then I joined DSM uh, and uh, for a decade, uh, we were able to shift the business of this 100 year old uh, company that actually started out in coal mining um, the, away from these unsustainable business towards businesses that are much more uh, in line with improving the planet and improving our lives, such as nutrition, renewable energy, sustainable plastics, and a drive towards a circular economy. So I always felt that companies must be responsible not only for delivering products uh, that improve our lives, but also for the downstream effects of these products, what happens after the use. And at DSM, I realized that uh, we have many challenges in the world and governments alone cannot solve them. It's really the private sector, it's really companies, their global footprint uh, that can make a big, big change in advocating for change and then implementing the change through innovation of their products and their processes. So Stefan, you now are the CEO of Aptar, but you saw this with other CEOs, right? That the responsibility really the buck stops with you, right? And so companies, not governments, really have to take responsibility for this. Is that right? Yeah, it's. I would say it's really a combination. You need both. Right. In the end, uh, government set uh, the rules uh, of the game of business, if you like. Uh, but businesses implement change and businesses operate uh, mm -hmm. uh, their factories. And often... I can be ahead of governments in terms of what's possible and what uh, should be aspired to and therefore lead the way and do it in collaboration with government. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but it's profits are good, but the products have to be good and the right, planet has right. to be good. So, um, so in an article, I, I saw you quoted as saying, never stop learning. It's a big world out there. Go out there and engage face to face. What did you mean by that? We, we are, of course, all immersed in this uh, massive technology around us. It's so easy to send a text and an email uh, rather than sitting down with someone and talking through a dilemma or a strategy. So being face to face like we are here, you can see the body language, you can see and hear inflections, and you get to know people and allow them to get to know you. So I always encourage people to f find the courage and curiosity to really discover what it is like in uh, walking in other people's shoes. One way to do that um, is taking on assignments in different regions and different functions or different businesses, especially early in our career where we're still very impressionable. And the experience of dealing with new challenges really 
uh, keeps us humble and learning all the time. And with, with you, too, you have lived in seven countries, so you had to understand what those different cultures were like, right? So you've moved around the world, so you had to understand in terms of the work you were doing, the impact on those countries and the outlook that other people had. So tell us a little bit about, you know, that living in different cultures and the impact that it had on you and, and how that formed what you did as a, as a leader. One of the greatest benefits really of, of moving to a new country, when you think about it, especially if it's a country where you don't speak the language or don't know the culture, it gives you that feeling of being in the minority. And uh, especially for a white male, that can be very humbling. Uh, so that experience really helped me greatly appreciate the value of being inclusive and welcoming and having a diverse group of people around the table to make better decisions. So you lived in many different countries. It had an impact on your personal and your professional development. And so how did that impact you then in terms of you as a CEO, you as a leader? One of the big aha moments I had uh, as I grappled with living in different countries is uh, in the beginning, and that took years, I had kind of this constant algorithm go off in my head. Okay, this is like this, and this was different where I came from, and this is better or worse. And quickly, or eventually, I realized nobody cares what you think, whether it's better or worse. It just is. And what is much, much more interesting is to figure out why things are the way they are. What is the history of the place? What are the politics of the place? What are the traditions, the demographics that shape that culture? And then translating to business, what does it mean for the consumer, the marketplace, our customers? So that really um, shaped my thinking about business, particularly consumer facing businesses. Preserving the Planet, the Power of People and Products. And Stefan Tand is CEO of Aptar Group. Aptar is a leading global supplier of a broad range of innovative dispensing, sealing, and active packaging solutions for beauty, personal care, and home care products, prescription and over-the-counter drugs, and food and beverages. The topics we cover are all current, and a new topic with a new game changer is released on the third Thursday of every month. This is a great way to stay current on relevant issues happening around us and around the world. Now let's return to our conversation with Stefan Tanda. Recent news noted that Aptar joined the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, that you launched a sustainable materials task force to address market expectations for sustainable products and that Aptar signed the new plastics economy global commitment. How will you and other CEOs change how you run the business and the impact you and other companies can make on the planet by joining in these partnerships? Yes, Janice, I'm actually proud to, to say that Aptar is a sustainability leader in our industry, and we're now committed to accelerate our efforts further. We're excited to work in those partnerships that you mentioned, and serve as a business thought leader and advocate to drive uh, and accelerate progress towards a circular economy and sustainable products in the packaging industry. We want to learn from, but also lead in these partnerships that include many of our customers and industry stakeholders. Take plastics, for example. Despite its reputation, uh, plastics actually has one of the lowest possible environmental footprints. However, they have to be fully recycled as an integral part of the circular economy. We cannot just use things once and then throw them away. Sadly, in this country, recycling rates are about half of what they are elsewhere. Through the new plastics economy commitment and working with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, we can help bring about a circular economy much more rapidly. You say that, but I look sometimes in our waters, in our ponds, in our lakes, and I see these plastic bottles. What do we do about that? I mean, it, people toss them in and I think, oh my goodness, we're polluting the planet. Stefan, what, what should we be doing as consumers? There is behavior change is needed and that behavior change is including recycling. I mean, you don't throw stuff away that you just use once. So it does uh, need uh, market incentives and it does need uh, behavior change. 
So we, up to the consumer too to not Absolutely. do this and recycle. Absolutely. So, but the steps that you're taking in terms of your company, what Aptar is doing. So your your products are biodegradable, or you you recycle them so that they don't pollute the planet. Is that right? That, that's correct. So we are uh, offering products that have post-consumer recycle content in them and develop products that are fully recyclable. One example is uh, we are working actually with uh, the e-commerce platform called Loop, mm -hmm. um, working with uh, companies like Procter & Gamble and Unilever uh, in a, a system that brings containers back and uses uh, our pumps that can be recycled. In addition, Aptar has launched a line of dispensing uh, closures in Europe that are made with post-consumer recycled resins. and. Uh, continue to look for more sustainable resins. Yeah, so that, again, that media, the backlash about the bottled water. So Aptar is playing a big role in this, right? Well, actually, we are not playing in bottled waters today, but the, the big problem with the bottled waters is this flat cap that you screw off and throw away. Okay. So the bottle actually ends up in the recycling stream and the flat cap ends up in the ocean. Uh, so we have launched solutions where the cap stays with the bottle or just has an easy flip lid that remain in the recycling stream. And you're doing, so that's that new flip lid that you Correct. new technology. Right. Okay. You know, I read a lot. In fact, there's an article in directors and boards with, um, Indra Nui's on the cover and, app, and it really talks about, um, boards wrestling with ESG, the ESG agenda, environmental, social, and governance metrics. So how do you work with your board on the societal challenges in each key geography to assess your performance on those material ESG metrics that are important to investors? You know, what your investors want to know about. How do you, how do you grapple with that? Well, it, it is a fact that investors really want to know increasingly how you future-proof your product, you future-proof your company, and what you're doing also about climate risk. Mm -hmm. So um, we, of course, work through that with the board as well. And um, one of the ratings that uh, investors follow closely is, of course, the MSCI um, sustainability ranking. And over a period of time, the composition of the board, our product uh, uh, performance, our work on uh, sustainable and uh, using renewable energy in the company uh, has led us to uh, now have an ESG rating of A, which is the highest. Also, AFTA has been named one of Barron's top 100 most sustainable companies in its most recent 2019 ranking. So there's a whole set of uh, initiatives that come together. Congratulations. Thank you. We're going to be watching that with other companies. So we should look at companies to see what their their ranking is, Absolutely. correct? And in terms of investing in them as well. You know, and although it's much about the planet, which is really important, it's also about people's lives too, right? So you've designed a unique nasal spray device, which I've read about, the first approved by the FDA, and it's used to reverse the effects of an opioid overdose within minutes. Can you tell us about this life-saving product? No, unfortunately, it is uh, due to the cause of uh, yeah. the... the uh, terrible opioid epidemic we have in this country. But indeed, um, uh, we've developed a uh, nasal device uh, that uh, is sold under the Narcan brand to administer naloxone, which reverses the effects of opioid overdose. And today, uh, all first responders have that, and it really saves uh, countless lives. Um, similar technology we use uh, for other drug delivery purposes. For example, just recently, Johnson Johnson uh, launched an antidepressant called Spravato um, that is also because the, uh, used in that way because the blood-brain barrier can be crossed very quickly. So all of our products impact uh, daily lives, and of course, uh, pharmaceutical products have an especially high impact. That's fantastic. So you work with these drug companies and you work with hospitals and first responders in terms of really helping them. Can you speak about your vision and the company's strategic priorities that are driving Aptar? Uh, given your tagline, which states, which I love, deliver solutions, shape the future, and some of the key accomplishments in 2018 that are taking you on this path. Sure. I mean, one of the things I felt very strongly about is to have a very simple strategy. We have it on one page. It's the same strategy we tell investors we have in the plants, we have in the office, uh, no secrets. 
Uh, let me just talk about three of those strategies that are on that strategy one page. One is, of course, uh, organic growth. Uh, um, after a period of slow or no growth, uh, we've really accelerated the top line this year. We grew 8% really uh, as a result of growing in every market, uh, in every region around the, con- uh, around the world. And uh, another one I'm very proud of is, of course, uh, delivering talent and, and uh, uh, leadership improvements. With your great help, Janice, we brought in uh, Sheila Winseller as our new C- Chief Human Resource Officer. Uh, she's really a proven senior HR executive. And uh, we also appointed Ms. Chang Wei Gong as an, uh, head of Aptar Asia. Uh, she's a, a very experienced global executive and also a tireless advocate of inclusion and diversity. And it's actually on the speaker circuit, uh, especially in Asia, Asia quite a bit. For a company our size, we actually have a remarkable corporate university that kind of imbues uh, the values uh, and the leadership principle of the company. And then, of course, uh, uh, we measure our progress with uh, employee engagement surveys and uh, town halls and Q&A sessions. And uh, I'm happy to report that, that this year's survey brought significant improvements. The third one I wanted to highlight maybe is uh, after is a result of many acquisitions of, over the year. And also in 2018, we've made uh, some substantial acquisitions. Uh, one of them is CSP Technologies that actually helps to improve food safety and uh, shelf life with an active uh, packaging technology. And so you really focused, uh, as you just mentioned, on having um, a very diverse team, which is music to my ears, because I believe that diversity does create innovation. So that's part of your vision. And how are you developing this team locally and globally? First uh, part is really to recognize when you're in a consumer facing business, most of the important decisions are made locally, in country. Uh, while it's hard to admit you cannot run China or India from Chicago, just as you cannot run uh, the U.S. Uh, from Shanghai. And it um, takes some humility to admit that. So you need to have first-rate people in country. And you can only attract those first-rate people if they feel embraced in the company and they feel like they're joining a family where they can make it to the very top if that's what they choose to. Uh, we, of course, have a process to identify the high potential. And now this year, we've kicked off a mentor program where each board director uh, mentors uh, two of the top potentials. And of course, we do that also inside the company, but we also enlisted the help of the board. So locally and globally, then if people can see themselves, then they feel like, well, I can rise up to the top of that organization. And so you're intentional and you're focused on diversity and inclusion in the C-suite and the board level. In fact, you and I met when you and, and Aptar were honored at the 2017 Women's Forum of New York Breakfast of Corporate Champions. Uh, and we look forward to honoring you again in 2019 when uh, the or this organization will honor those companies with 30% or more women on their boards. So, we met then, and so I know that you're very focused on uh, diversity and inclusion at the board level and also in the C-suite. But so you've had an impact on having a very diverse culture uh, in your companies, uh, and in, and you've led that at Aptar. So tell us about how you're you're doing that and, and the importance uh, to you personally and professionally. Yeah, it, it's really, the, as we talked in the beginning, the kind of company I want to be part of. Um, and uh, f- I feel passionately about it. So all of our senior leaders have r- lived and worked abroad for an extensive period of time. Of course, we have uh, strengthened the uh, gender diversity on our executive uh, committee with Sheila and Shangwei coming on board, board. And not surprisingly, it has already changed the tone of the conversation and we are much more focused on uh, the matters at hand. And as you've met, mentioned, uh, we've been recognized as a leader on the board side as well. And uh, we are will achieve 40% uh, gender uh, diversity in our board in a couple of months. Maybe in any business, but for sure in our kind of business, gender parity is certainly absolutely something we should be striving for. But you always make sure that you have great skills and experience. You know, you don't do this without making sure that the person is highly qualified. And I've worked with you on this, and I know <laughs> you, you really want excellence. So when you're looking for leaders, tell us a little bit about what you look for in terms of their experiences and the attributes. So 
competencies and attributes that you look for in your leaders that you're hiring globally and locally? Many of those factors are often called the soft factors, but in the end, they're really the ones that make somebody successful and distinguish them. So, of course, the skills and contributions and uh, track record go without saying. But what I'm really looking for is authenticity, a, a service orientation, uh, and at the same time, uh, a good understanding of who people are, uh, an ability to face reality openly admit and learn from mistakes and, and highlight the learnings. So that requires some humility and a passion for the company's mission and values. Um, I see on your desk here a picture of Indra Nui. So it, it's really this performance with a purpose, uh, a, a notion of servant leadership that is combined with a purpose and the passion for the company. That for me is is the, the best package. And you said earlier in the article for somebody to constantly be learning. So I know you're always looking for that intellectual curiosity, somebody to always be out there, they're learning. Um, so for those leaders who want to be leading tomorrow's organizations, what advice do you give them in terms of preparing to be the next Stefan Tanda or the next <laughs> Indra Nui or the next, you know, leader of a major organization? How should they prepare to do that? It's really all about never stopping to reach for your full potential. And that means never stop learning, uh, getting out in the world and regularly walk in other people's shoes. Um, and at the same time, getting to know yourself very well. This uh, ability to really know yourself, be authentic is critical. You can't lead other people if you're not comfortable in your own skin. And then people look for people who have convictions, who have passions, who have a point of view. So you need to have that sense of direction. You need to be able uh, to provide that sense of direction uh, with passion and then connect and develop those people because you cannot do it alone. Um, it is all in the connection with people. And then last not least, it's very important to keep the eye on the ball to generate results, results for the organization and results for the planet. So it really those few things that I would highlight. Those are wonderful, wonderful pieces of advice and tips for our audience and our leaders of tomorrow. But I would wonder if you have any closing comments for our audience. Well, I would just say I, I feel very fortunate um, to be here with you, to be able to lead uh, a wonderful uh, company, a company with an outstanding sense of purpose. It is so important to surround yourself with people that share your passion, that have that open mind that are very, very tough in going into the subjects, but are not very involved with their ego. I, I believe at APTA we make a real great progress in that direction and we make real great progress in being inclusive. I really enjoyed our discussion today. Thanks for all your help and keep holding us accountable. Stefan Tanda, thank you so much for an inspiring conversation on preserving the planet, the power of people and products. We've learned so much from you today, and I look forward to continuing our conversation. Thank you so much to our audience for this remarkable conversation with Stefan Tanda. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit our website at ellagroup.com. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes of Leadership Reimagined, game-changing conversations. 